Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagar Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space uh, Conference and Trade Show in National Harbor, Maryland, just outside uh, Washington, D.C. And we have with us uh, Gary Geisen, who is the CEO of Liquid Robotics, a Boeing company uh, now, and uh, Sir George, uh, Admiral, Sir, retired Admiral Sir George Zambellis, who had one of the coolest titles in the world as uh, first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy, who is a strategic advisor to the company. Gentlemen, thanks, thanks very much for the time. Gary, I want to start with you. Sure. Um, congratulations uh, on the deal. Um, but there's always a concern whenever a big company buys a small innovative company that somehow that is not going to work out as well, that there's a tendency to sort of stifle innovation. Sure. Um, talk to us a little bit about what this means for liquid robotics and how you guys are going to maintain that sort of culture of speed, culture of innovation. No criticism on Boeing, but it is a very, very large, you know, the world's largest aerospace company, in fact. Sure. So one of the uh, great things that's happened, Boeing acquired us but kept us separate. So we're a wholly owned subsidiary. We're actually not Boeing in place. We're still Liquid Robotics in place. Same team, same management team, same mission as a commercial company. So we're actually a, a commercial platform provider. We just happen to serve oil and gas, defense, maritime surveillance, different markets with the same platform. Uh Sir George, you know, why did you decide to join the company? I know you're advising a few companies, but why Liquid Robotics? Well, Gary would say that he chose me, but I think I chose him. Uh, and the reason is that this amazing company, uh, the small committed team, really hits a sweet spot for me. It's, uh, it's the mix of underwater dominance, uh, amazing technology, and great teamwork and leadership. And I'm very happy to be able to advise them on the wider aspects of maritime domain uh, awareness and how to make the most of this market. And we have a more in-depth conversation with Sir George on the very issue of, of innovation, but that's where I want to take and get, get your uh, take on, on, on both of this. You know, talk to us a little bit about the Navy's Digital Ocean Initiative. I mean, there's Task Force Ocean. We talked to Admiral Gallaudet, uh, who is the oceanographer and navigator of the, of the Navy, another great title from a, from a U.S. perspective for the U.S. Navy. Tell us a little bit about the role you guys will, will play with, with an array of not just products, but sort of the networks that you guys are thinking about creating. Sure. So one of the things this platform does, this is a persistent mobile platform that can host sensors at the surface of the ocean. So that's really a gap because the only way to do that today are with ships, and the further offshore you are, the more expensive it is. So it becomes cost prohibitive in a lot of ways to actually have vessels out there with sensors gathering data. Secondly, we're a linkage between things that are undersea. So either a target that we're tracking, like a submarine, talking to a seafloor sensor, as an example, acoustically communicate with our platform at the surface, and then we can in real time relay that contact report or that information to an aircraft, either manned or unmanned, shoreside system, uh, satellite communications, et cetera, and spread it across the globe. So it's a linkage that wasn't there from a persistent sense. When a ship goes out, it'll go out, do a mission, come back. We're out there year-round, persistent network of sensors, if you will, collecting data, and in real time can feed that data to all sorts of different constituents. And from the standpoint of a lifelong operator, as you were, what's the value of systems like this from your standpoint? It, it works two ways. First of all, it's a, a test of the technology that Gary's just described, but actually it's a bigger test. It's a test of whether navies, nations, procurement systems uh, are prepared to invest and experiment as they break new ground through innovation. Do, speaking about innovation, what are the key, um, you and I have spoken over the years about how you maintain an innovative culture, sure. um, how, uh, you know, a, a couple of fascinating discussions, including with some government folks, uh, you know, as Dr. Carter, former U.S. Defense Secretary, was working that whole innovation uh, agenda. It's sort of a two-part question. I'd like to get, Sir George, your, your view on this as well. You know, what are the keys to maintaining the innovative culture that you guys have? And what do you think are the keys, you know, having, having been part of that discussion on the DOD level, for DOD to continue? Because there is a concern that this administration may or may not be as, as minded on that. You know, a few folks have, uh, have said, you know, we're, we're going to be much more about buying things and not this sort of n nebulous, uh, you know, playing. You know, talk, talk to us a little bit about both culture, but also, you know, how, how, to, how DOD should be approaching it in new administration as they think about their innovation strategies. Yeah, so I think it's not unlike what it's been in the past. I mean, if we don't innovate as a country, we're going to lose to others that are. And so certainly nations are grabbing things, taking more risks, uh, more early adopters, more trials of things. And we're in 18 countries right now. We're a small little company. 
and yet we've been able to get a global footprint of people using our technology. And so we are now operational with the Navy, which is great. Uh, it took a decade, so it took a long time. So I think that kind of slog through a process that is really designed and built to acquire big things, multiple billion dollar bombers, carriers, submarines, et cetera, not acquisition designed to get something like this that's in the $300,000, $400,000 range, right? And so we need to continue to tap rapid funds. We need to take risks and get these things out. We're, we're now in the water. We've done 1.3 million nautical miles with this platform. This is a proven platform. And yet we're still fighting the fight to, to get it you know, broadly deployed. And what do you think the key is to maintaining an innovative culture? Because you come from a long line of working at innovative companies sure. like this. So this is your latest step in this you know, long, long, long journey of pushing gigantic rocks up very steep hills. Sure. So you know, what are some of the keys you think for, for maintaining that sort of innovative edge? Well, one of the key things, we've got uh, everybody on the team. First, we're based in Silicon Valley, and so it's kind of the, the land of the cowboy. We're, we're used to being innovative. Uh, small companies still. Again, not Boeing employees, but we're liquid robotics employees. And so we have to continue to push the envelope, keep doing exactly what we do, but yet on the other side, take advantage of the leverage that we can get from Boeing in terms of global footprint, other technologies that we can incorporate. So we can be our innovative hub as a small group and yet le leverage a bigger machine, if you will, but keep doing what we're doing. And we have not stopped innovating and, and we won't. We're going to keep pushing the ball forward. Um, Sir George, few, very few uh, organizations uh, have uh, been steeped as more in tradition than your old organization, uh, so, you know, more than 600 years of tradition in the Royal Navy. But at the same time, it's also been uh, a force that throughout its history has also been among the most innovative of navies at, 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 at the right exact times when it needed to be, uh, whether it was the aircraft carrier, the angled deck, uh, a whole vast array of, of, of technologies, too much to go into. But talk to us about, you know, from what that balance and how you drive innovation in a military service that, you know, can sometimes be, you know, hue maybe more toward the, the agreed and the understood as opposed to the new. It's about leadership. It's about courage. You have to be approaching an evangelist because if you don't, you won't break through. And that's why I so entirely commend the leadership of CNO, um, who has John Richardson, who's just done a fantastic job in driving through the culture of acceptance of innovation. Um, and there are some who argue that these small platforms will ultimately be a threat to the big platforms. I couldn't disagree more. This is about complementary performance in technology. This is about making people think differently. And so this really does boil down to leadership. Do you think, um, what's, what's going to be the next big step for you guys, you know, we, we um, you know, you guys are at the point where uh, you're, 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 you're not quite through the valley of death, right? So you're like a little bit more mature than some other pure startup guys are, sure. but you're, you're, you know, you are a Boeing company now that gives you, but I mean, sort of what's the next sort of evolutionary step for you guys? So the interesting thing about this platform, we don't look at it as a hardware thing, a, as a single unit. It hosts sensors, it has communication capabilities, it has networking capabilities. And, and of that you're talking about the, 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 the legendary wave glider yeah. line that we see in front of us. Yes, exactly. And so the first part of our mission was to connect things from undersea to space, which we've done. The second part of the mission is to connect them together into a mesh network across the ocean. So effectively to sensor network the ocean. Never been done before, uh, too cost prohibitive to do so. Uh, not reliable enough things out there that can survive hurricanes and cyclones and such. And so our next mission is to put fleets and fleets of these out there, have them communicating with each other, sharing resources, sharing compute power, communications power, et cetera. And we'll have information that we've never before had uh, on the ocean, both for defense security purposes and other purposes, commercial and science purposes. Uh, at the time, the Royal Navy was the world's largest navy. Uh, it would be thinking about stuff like this. But what sort of a role do technologies like this have in today's Royal Navy, as far as you're concerned? Well, it's as you said earlier, it's a continuing um, opportunity for the attitude for innovation and creativity. Once upon a time, young lieutenants would modify the uh, electromechanical gunnery systems through their own innovation to do a better job in war. Now, the black boxes have taken away that creativity at a very uh, low tactical level 
and it has to be replaced by the willingness to take on new projects and to experiment and believe it or not, to make mistakes. The great thing about uh, courage and leadership, whether it's an intermediate or a senior level, is the willingness to make errors. Otherwise, you never make any progress at all. Gentlemen, thanks very, very much for this time. And I would like to do an entire interview and talk to you just on that issue. Sir George, thank you very much. Gary, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Good to see you. You're again. welcome.